Welcome everybody to another virtual workshop at the Albright Institute. Uh, my name is Matthew Adams and I'm the director here. Uh, today we are helping to launch a book called The Idols of Isis from Assyria to the Internet, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2020 by Aaron Tuganot. Uh, he is here today and will be speaking along with Nili Wazana about the book. Before we begin, uh, just want to say I'm going to link a few things in the chat for you, including some content about Aaron, uh, some ways in which you can help the Albright. If you're interested and you like the content that you see today, please reach out to us uh, and support what we're doing. Uh, let me start with a brief introduction of our speakers today. Aaron Tugenhoff is a scholar of the ancient Middle East and a dedicated humanities teacher. He received his PhD from the Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at NYU in 2012 and also holds degrees in art history and social thought from the University of Chicago. From 2014 to 2018, Aaron was a Harper Fellow in the Society of Fellows in Liberal Arts at the University of Chicago. He also held postdoctoral fellowships at Maximilian University in Munich and right here in Jerusalem at the WF Albright Institute for Archaeological Research in Jerusalem, as well as the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. He currently teaches humanities at Bard College Berlin, and I will tell you he is on the job market now. So if you like what you hear today, please look him up. You'll see his CV uh, linked in the content below. Uh, interviewing and commenting on the book is Professor Nili Wazana, who is the chair, the Yezkel Kaufman Chair for Biblical Studies uh, and in the Department of History of the Jewish People at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So Nili, I think you're gonna to wanna to start today, so I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna start by a startling coincidence. Um, I received today the news, which were entitled, Scars But Still Standing, Mosul Museum Reopens at Last. And it talks about the um, attack of ISIS, which the book of, uh, of Aaron also um, takes as a starting point and I'm going to just quote a very short paragraph from that article, which re I received today. Ninveh's renowned cultural heritage museum, known for the Islamic State's disastrous attack on its treasures, has finally reopened to the public. So this is kind of like a, you know, when, the, when Aaron came to me and asked me to talk about his book, his really wonderful book, which I really recommend as a Hanukkah or a Christmas present. Um, or any other occasion, of course. Uh, I want. I, I. I think it's a. It's still in the news. It's still relevant, and it's still very much uh, interesting, as as well as says eye opening. So I want to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book, and then we're going to open the discussion between Aaron and me. And um, Aaron's book was triggered by a video which we've all been exposed to. It's a video of men smashing a Syrian sculpture sculptures in Iraq's Mosul Museum published online in February 2015. And there's uh, an image there, and maybe Matthew, you can show it to, uh, to the people. Three men with sledgehammers smashing a lamasu, um, this uh, creature which has a human face and uh, bull's body and, uh, and uh, eagle wings, and uh, smashing this lamasu and to Aaron was immediately reminded of an Assyrian relief found in the ancient Assyrian palace at Khosabad of King Sargon II from the uh, second half of the eighth century BCE, uh, just 15 miles away from Mosul, but more than 2,500 years earlier, of course. This relief bears what Tugendhaft calls an uncanny resemblance, and I totally agree. It is a very strange, uncanny resemblance to the video, three men with axes smashing the toppled sculpture of the king. So the book is a journey taken from the place of the resemblance across time of an image of men destroying images. So it's an image of destroying images. Uh, its starting point is the notion that there is no such a thing as a world without images. It may be a given, but we have to say it. We live in a world of images. Furthermore, images as an approximation of the truth are multiple. So we can't just have one image. We have multiple uh, images which create our world, create our worldview as well as our world. So um, 
this is uh, this is uh, the the fact is, and I'm quoting from the book that destroying images becomes an image of on its own. In other words, iconoclasm is an image. It also reminds us that images play a crucial role in politics. Joint images bind a community together alongside shared language, lineage, territory, and we may add common customs, values, and religion. And I think I'm quoting here a little bit of Herodotus, which is perhaps Aaron's next project, but that's a, that's a, side, uh, a side point. And Tugendhaft asks, what does this video reveal about the role images play in politics? Why destroy images? And finally, he moves on to the philosophical question, can we find better ways to live together in their midst? And this is perhaps, uh, um, this is the thing that, uh, 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 that is new for me because I come from the academic world. We usually take a look at from the outside and kind of zoom out uh, of, uh, of um, phenomena in the past and try to analyze it. But Aaron does do does the extra mile and he asks, what can we do in order to make this world better, which I think is a great thing. I always run away from it, but it's a, I think it's a great philosophical question. So his book probes these questions over three chapters. First, he considers the claim that the sculptures in the Mosul museums were idols that must be destroyed. In this chapter, he looks at the diachronic dimensions of smashing idols, seen as a revival of an original time of purity, going back to the days of Muhammad and further back to the days of Ibrahim, Abraham, uh, who uh, demanded a regime without images, according to the Quran. And I'm quoting Ibrahim objects to images then, not because they are powerless, but because they exert the wrong kind of power. So again, uh, according to the story of Abraham or Ibrahim, smashing the idols uh, is, is a question of political power. What kind of political power are we interested in? And uh, this political power is uh, uh, seen uh, through the images that Abraham tries to, uh, to smash. Next, he deals with the setting of the video in a museum. He explores the significance of a museum in the past 150 years Museum is modern replacements of churches and palaces, centers of political power, representing the civilized us versus the vandal, them, uh, us that go to museums versus them that smash, say, uh, museum items. And I think that uh, we, one of the major points that I would like to talk about with uh, Aaron is the question of European museums which display Assyrian imperial symbols such as the Lamassu figures in order to create an ideal and glorified image of their own empire. So they're using uh, ancient empires in order to, uh, to present their own empires. And finally, it takes up the fact that the destruction was recorded in order to be seen. Looking at the way the video imitates first person shooter video games such as Call of Duty, uh, Aaron, uh, uh, I think uh, tongue in mouth uh, in cheek uh, uh, admits that he wasted monies of funds that he got in order to buy a Call of Duty uh, video games and to try and, and see how this works. And um, it, it, in fact, these first person shooter video games themselves originate in media coverage of American wars. And again, I'm quoting and reproducing such images in the video ISIS intentionally mirrors images of American imperialism. In other words, uh, ISIS videos imitate video games that are themselves imitations of the real world. So um, I think that we can move on now to, to the question and to the discussion that I have with, the, with Aaron um, coming out of this really thought intriguing book. And Aaron, um, I'd like to ask you, you talk a lot about pluralism versus homogeneity and the smashing of idols as a, as a sign of homogeneity. And I would like to, to reintroduce a notion that you did talk about in your book, and that's the notion of imperialism. And the question is, is there a connection between imperialism and, uh, and iconoclasm? So first of all, Neely, thank you so much for those lovely remarks and for being 
willing to do this. It's always such a pleasure to have you as an interlocutor and um, thank you to Matt and to the Albright for hosting this event. So what is the relationship between iconoclasm and imperialism? Is that, was that the question? Yes. Yeah, so that's, it's a wonderful question. And it's a question, as you know, that runs through the entirety of the book. Um, because the, the way at least that I talk about imperialism in the book is connected to this question of homogeneity, as you mentioned, right? The question of, in a sense, the, really the question of the world state. So it's not just empire, but it's the empire that, that at least um, aspires to uh, world domination and believes itself to be the only one true legitimate form of political life, which using the terminology of my book, but we'd have to get into the, the nitty gritty there, I would actually say is not a, a form of political life at all. And here I'm um, following on Hannah Arendt, uh, be precisely, well, Hannah Arendt and Aristotle in that real political life is about managing plurality. It's, but it, therefore it requires that we accept the fact that as human beings, we are um, diverse and different and that it's precisely that difference that needs to be managed uh, through politics and the, the move to a kind of homogeneity in, uh, in the type of imperialism that I'm talking about, either the ancient imperialism of Sargon II saying that he is the king of the world or in the medieval uh, guys, right? So these are different places where it comes up in the book. In the medieval guys where I'm talking about the medieval Islamic uh, um, discussions of the story of Ibrahim, uh, in opposition to Nimrud, who is sort of the medieval Islamic stand-in for the ancient uh, Mesopotamian empires, who there again, um, the, the idea that Nimrud uh, rules the entire world and that's connected there. Um, and, and then also as comes up in, later in the book with respect, as you mentioned, to certain modern uh, ideas about uh, human universalism. And so these are not identical and they all have to be uh, nuanced, but I try to draw connections throughout. So what's the relationship to iconoclasm? Well, I mean, let's just for starters, right? Because I think it's a huge question. Let's just take this image from uh, Sargon II's palace that I, that I show, right? That is, um, was so similar, as you mentioned, un so uncannily similar to the image from the Islamic State. Um, and here's another, here's a larger version of the panel, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we see, I think, you, I think you can see my cursor, right? You can see the, the section with the iconoclasm of the king being, the king statue being smashed, but then within this larger palace relief. Um, just, um, by the by, I should mention, of course, here we are here. This is not an image of the actual um, panel, the actual relief sculpture, but it's a drawing of the relief sculpture. And that's because uh, the relief itself no longer exists uh, or it's been lost. It's probably the bottom of a river. Um, and so we're reliant on the 19th century drawings um, that were made uh, in situ at the excavations at Korsabad. Um, and so one of the things I asked about when thinking about this image was if you are claiming to be the only legitimate power in the world, right? Um, if you're claiming that all other claims to political power are illegitimate, that's one. And two, if you know that um, asserting that political power, asserting any political power requires images that convey uh, that power and produce the dedication to the regime that images do. And we can talk more about how that works. Then if those two things together would suggest that um, you would want to destroy other people's images, you would want to eradicate other images, which is, which are making counterclaims, right? Saying, wait a second, your image does not tell the whole truth. Your image is only one way of doing things. It's only one way of articulating how we as human beings 
can live together politically. There's this other one, right? That I that it provides an opportunity to live in a different kind of way, right? And it's precisely the nature of images, precisely because images are always only partial, that they're always there's always the possibility for some alternative image to arise. Um, and so again, so on the one hand, right? Then if we're thinking this through, if you're trying to claim that you're the only legitimate uh, power worldwide, universally, then it would make sense to try to destroy any claims to an alternate legitimate way of life or political way of life. Okay. So, but if so, why show this image? I, I, I don't know if, Neely, I don't, I, I, I've been talking a lot, so maybe if you feel free to, fit in, but this is my, my, in a way, let me just, the last sentence, right? And we can, if we want, we can talk about it is, um, here we have not the destruction of images, but the image of image destruction. And by showing the destruction of an image, one is also necessarily showing that image and therefore in a sense admitting to the possibility of alternative in images. And so that's in a way for me, the, the crux of trying to understand this uh, relief panel by, by Sargon II is what is it that would motivate you to admit the existence of counter images, even if in the form of their destruction. So in a sense, and again, I, I think this is, this is one of the best points in your book that the destruction of images is an image on its own because you, you can't avoid it, but you don't really think about it when you see uh, the video of uh, ISIS uh, men destruct, destroying the, the, the Lamassu uh, uh, statue in the Mosul Museum, but it really is an image on its own. And I think this is something that, and again, whenever we do um, depict two images, especially if these kind of, you know, very far away from each other, but, uh, but uncannily similar, uh, you also have to ask what is, not just what is similar, but what is different between these images. And uh, I would say that, um, you know, looking at the panel, um, this is just one piece of a very long and uh, structured um, image that the Assyrian kings, or in this particular sense, uh, case uh, Sargon II, is trying to convey to, to the, the viewers, whoever they are, who came to the palace and saw these symbols of power. So the image of destroying another king's statue as an image of political power of black and white. And this is kind of like you, you were talking in your book about this no grayish zone, uh, which uh, depicts the ISIS ideology. It's us versus them. They are the, the, uh, the, the kufr and we are the believers and the, we have to, uh, there is no gray uh, zone in between us. We cannot allow this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, different points of view or different uh, images um, and therefore we have to destroy everything else that is uh, that is different from ours. And I think this is one of the one of the differences between the Assyrian Empire and the the way that ISIS uses the image of destroying the Labasu and the other um, I mean we do not I don't I, I don't know how many other we do have of course images uh, of other ISIS uh, videos which you didn't talk about some of them are very cruel, which are also similar to Assyrian, uh, cruelty shown on panels in the Assyrian uh, palaces. I think this kind of, uh, of you know, uh, beheading and public executions and uh, cutting off of uh, different parts of the body. And I don't want to go into detail, you know, gruesome details here, but I think that there is a huge resemblance there as well. Uh, you, you didn't go in your book into that. Absolutely. But I think Absolutely, no. And so I think that it's really important to um, underline that images of image destruction um, rarely occur in isolation, right? And so this was actually um, something that was brought to my attention early on when I was working on this project and I was speaking to um, the great uh, um, early modern uh, German art historian, uh, um, Joseph Leo Kerner, um, and was talking about images of uh, from of iconoclasm during the from the Reformation, and he pointed out to me that these that 
these images, though now very often reproduced precisely because they're images of iconoclasm and they, you find them in books about iconoclasm and so you think that they stand alone, really originally they were part of much larger albums of Im images that fit a much larger picture of what was being what was being presented, right? And so that you needed to understand them within that context of other images. And this is, I think, just another case to add to what you're describing, right? That the image, and this is why I wanted to show that larger, and it's still just a segment of the panel uh, program uh, from Sargon II's uh, palace, that the, the image of iconoclasm is part of a much larger program, uh, as you say, right? In the in Assyrian palaces. And I don't, you're right, I don't go into the um, gruesome videos in the book uh, from ISIS, but I think you're absolutely right that there's a parallel there. And I think that it's important to recognize that the um, iconoclastic images, right? Those images of whether the Mosul Museum or of Nimrud that perhaps we, the audience and the audience here are particularly cared about because of those of us who care about the ancient Near East and, and archeology, span right? They were coming out together with all of these other videos that were going on um, as well. And so early on, I started talking about um, ISIS's virtual palace, right? Because unlike the palace that Sargon II um, and his fellow Neo-Assyrian kings built, right? Which was a palace that was on, you know, in three dimensions of, of, of physical walls, even though, and I get into this a little bit in the, in, in the book, there were ways for the Assyrian uh, regime to extend the range of their imagery beyond the palace itself, right? Through things like uh, seal impressions and, and, and other matters that reference back to the images on the palace wall, um, but it's still mainly a, a physical palace. Well, ISIS builds that palace uh, on the internet through, yes. uh, yeah, through our social media. And so it's a palace that simultaneously exists everywhere and nowhere. And I think, and, and I think that that's really crucial for understanding both the similarities and the differences um, that's going on, that we're going on here. And it's what leads to the, the final section of the book that talks about the importance of uh, social media as a way for political images to circulate today as compared to the uh, palace walls of the Assyri you know, Assyrian palaces. I mean, if I may say, I think, that the, 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 I think that the third chapter of this book is the first time that um, Sargon II and Mark Zuckerberg have been compared to one another. Um, I could be, I, I'm happy to be told that I'm wrong about that, but I think that that might be, I think that that's the case. I want, to, I want to ask you something about the, the role of museums in an empire and in our society, uh, because we like to think of museums as a very positive uh, uh, institution in our world, as a very civilized institution, as perhaps also advancing uh, the kind of plurality that you're interested in, in advancing as well. We're all uh, uh, interested. Um, I want to, again, a quote from the, uh, from the news um, that I received today, the reopening of the museum in Mosul was accompanied by the declaration that we're going to use cultural heritage as a means for peace building. This was, uh, this was issued uh, by Salih, the, the person from, who's responsible for the opening of the museum in, in Iraq, in Mosul. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, when we regard the, the history of the, uh, of the museums as actually as, uh, as, as part of an empire. And I'm, I'm, I wanna go back to, uh, you know, the question of, um, I, I wouldn't call them museums because that's an anachronism, but uh, the Assyrians did a little bit, something a little bit similar. I mean, they did bring yeah. to Assyria items from faraway lands and they put them on display. And the Babylonians built, uh, you know, the, the gardens uh, of Babylon and bring in all kinds of, uh, of plants to show to show that the center of the world is the place where you bring in everything from the outside. And this is exactly what the museums uh, at the beginning in the 19th century did. And I think that in many ways, they're still doing that. I mean, you, if you wanna look at the treasures of, of Mesopotamia, you go to London or you go to the Louvre or you go to Berlin, right? You go to the centers of these now past empires, but uh, yeah. can you, 
can you use museums nowadays to encourage or to promote peace and not just the um, the notions of empire and that you know the treasures of the worlds are concentrated within our centers no matter where they originated from right it's it's a great question and i'm going to try to provide a nuanced answer which i can understand it's and it's a really fine line that i'm going to be trying to to draw in answering this question first of all i should say that i don't know how you bring about peace so i don't know i don't think that's a little bit too too difficult what i what i will say is that i, I have something to say about how you bring about understanding and there might well be a relationship between understanding and peace, right? Understanding might play some role in peace, though I wouldn't necessarily want to go so far as to say that's the only thing. But, but if I can replace peace with understanding, I think that I, I, I'm uh, on a little bit more solid ground in trying to address the question a little bit more modestly. So first of all, I should say that I love museums and specifically I think you're not even you're not so much talking about museums you're talking about encyclopedic museums mm -hmm. and I love encyclopedic museums I grew up very close to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I almost grew up in the Metropolitan Museum of Art certainly in the years that I was coming of age um, in my later teens and and yet as you say right the, the the history of these institutions, right? What brought them about and a, a certain way of understanding what the, the institutions are about could be, can be quite problematic. And so this is the fine line that I want to try to tease out here. So as you know, in the, in the final section of the book, in the coda, I talk about, I bring this image from this passage from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's late work, um, Twilight of the Idols, where he talks about using a hammer not to smash images, but as if you, you used it as a tuning fork to tap them and to sort of hear what they uh, leave out, to hear their, their hollowness, but without destroying them. Because as I said before, all images are, are partial and therefore false by the standards of an Ibrahim. And so um, if if, and therefore, in that, from that perspective, there is no difference between idols and images, right? Um, you can, they're all going to be false. But if, if we realize that we can't live without them and, and we can't smash them, and therefore we can't smash the, only the false ones because that would mean that we were smash, smashing all of them, well, what can we do? Well, Nietzsche suggests, right, this possibility of tapping as an alternative to smashing. And then I build on that in the book to talk about not simply tapping sim single images, but tapping images against each other, right? This idea that each image, which is connected to different cultures and different ways of life and different political formations, right? Um, has certain positive elements and certain negative elements. And if we tap them against each other, we might be able to better understand both what they provide for us as human beings and what they also leave out. Uh, and I bring this as an answer to your question because that was in a sense, and I think it only was after writing this book that I realized this connection, that it was that experience that I had when I was walking through the halls of the Met Museum as a kid, because by, sit, by being in the Met, I was able to tap a Lamassu against a Picasso, against a Buddha, against a Impressionist painting or, or, or what have you, right? And I think that these museums are wonderful uh, venues for people to move beyond themselves and do that work of thinking that comes from questioning and tapping different possibilities, uh, different human possibilities against each other, right? That said, this, the, the, of course, as you, as you already mentioned, that's not necessarily the purpose, the initial, the, the, the initial purpose of these museums, right? There's the other side of it, right? Which is gather everything together in order to become a sign of one's own imperialism or one's own universal uh, majesty, right? Which is not a tapping uh, maneuver at all, right? And so that's the fine line, I think, that you need, to, you need to walk. How do you develop, how do you experience the museum as a, a venue and, and, a, and a welcoming to thinking and to tapping rather than as 
a as an image itself of a certain type of regime, type of imperialist regime. Yeah, I like that. Maybe I should uh, you should uh, try that for a, uh, as a as a you know profession to uh, yeah. to give advice to museums how to tap together yeah. different uh, you know maybe put together the video of ISIS together with the uh, uh, with the notion or the, the you know the the front uh, cover of uh, the book of uh, the um, of Layard of uh, you know the, yeah. uh, of the what they found in Nimve, which exactly. which also comes in where they show the Lamassu being drawn into uh, exactly. Um, it's it's really it's really very interesting for me as a biblical scholar, and I want to bring the Bible into the sure. uh, into this question. Um, the Bible also talks about the iconoclasm, of course, and it's uh, it's not exactly iconoclasm as much as uh, you know tearing down uh, the foreign uh, gods. Uh, uh, matzavot and then altars and uh, and asherot and uh, um, and basically uh, trying to uh, to create um, uh, um, I don't know if it's a monotheistic or a monotheistic uh, worldview. Um, do you think that the biblical notion of iconoclasm is also imperialistic? That's that's a question that's bothering me, hmm. and I wanted your your take on it. So that's interesting. I mean. On the one hand, if we're thinking about so let me see if I can connect it right. So on the one hand, right, whether it's the the biblical this is again the question of the relationship between the biblical and the midrashic, right? So as you know, the in the chapter on uh, on idols, the first chapter, I talk about the story of Ibrahim from the Quran, and then in uh, Islamic exegesis, but that story exists also within Jewish Midrash, Midrash exactly. right? And I think that that story, at least as I read it, right, as I argue, is about some claim that earthly politics is somehow illegitimate, earthly politics that requires these images, with these Nimrod's images or the people's images, and that Ibrahim or Abraham is seeking some type of way of, of, serving God, right? Uh, we, we say worshiping in English, but as you all, as we know, right, it's the same word. So it's really a political word of, of avodah, right? The, of serving God uh, directly without mediation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that, that does develop. I mean, again, really to answer this question really about the biblical is the question, well, what period are we talking about and how do we understand it? And is it henotheism or monotheism or mon monolatry and all these types of things, right? Um, and then is it universal, right? Because is it just within the land that this is supposed to take place and that somehow there's this interesting, I mean, and I think this is a larger issue within the Hebrew Bible that we, I'd love to talk to you about, right? About this balancing of the universal and the particular in the idea of you worship the universal God directly, but only in one place. Uh, in the world, and it's not expandable to the rest of the globe. And that itself is a paradoxical, or at least uh, uh, an idea filled with inner tension that is quite interesting to explore, right? Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I also, I'm not sure if that's possible. I mean, it's an idea, right, uh, to make that possible. Um, in, in a particular space, but of course, but you replace it with a temple and these types of things, right? So it's not completely empty of, uh, even if it's not specifically images, there are ways that the community is held together or the text. I don't, I mean, these are complicated. Yeah, because I come from a world of text and not yeah. a world of images. Um, yep. This is this is the kind of questions that I, I bother with, I, that sure. I'm interested in uh, to find out whether these kind of, um, you know, injunctions to, to create a world uh, of text. And I'm thinking, of course, about the story of the finding of the book in the days of uh, uh, Josiah uh, within the temple. And a lot of parallel stories uh, in Mesopotamia talk not just about text, but they talk about finding, I don't know, the image of uh, the god Shamash uh, uh, in the foundations of a temple, etc. So it's 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 a question of, of, um, of the place of the text within uh, monotheistic, text-oriented uh, uh, religion, 
Um, but basically, I agree with you that um, depicting a world without images is 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 impossible. Within our yep. world, uh, we talk about a human world which necessarily uses images and uses images sometimes in words. Yeah. No, absolutely. So one of the things. Be. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that what's what gets interesting is once you start realizing the techniques for making images of non-images of of no images, right? So, um, one of my early ventures years ago was um, I took a trip to Petra to see these. I'm sure you're familiar with these aniconic idols that are um, aniconic poly polytheism that one finds in, in in Petra from the Nabataeans, and which I found fa fascinating, and all of these sort of empty space iconic uh, uh, aniconism and these things, which is really right. How do you depict empty? How do you depict non-image? And yet that is the thing that nevertheless can do the work that I'm saying an image does, which is that it binds a community together, right? Um, likewise. The image that I talk about, uh, whether the story of Ibrahim, and again, bring you, whether it's in in Jewish tradition or in Islamic tradition, the story of Ibrahim or Abraham smashing the idols, whether it's as a story or whether it's a physical, like a, a visual representation of Ibrahim smashing the idols, which I uh, I don't have on my PowerPoint, unfortunately, but I um, it is in the book. Get the book; you can see it. Wonderful image. Um, these are images that can uh, produce a community, right? Incredibly rich and vibrant communities have gathered around images of you have no images or have smashing no images. images. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, that doesn't make them any less. It doesn't make act our actual life any less dependent on images. And it does raise one question, right? Whether it is beneficial or not. Uh, and this is a complicated question, beneficial or not for the images that we use to orient our lives, is it better for those images to, to admit that they are images and that, we, that we're living with images, right? And perhaps therefore in, introduce a certain amount of modesty into how we understand ourselves, or is it better for those images to claim a certain type of absoluteness, which, which one way of doing that is to claim that actually you're not living with images at all, right? And that's uh, an image that does that is a way, uh, is a kind of absolute claim. I, I just want to, I want to stress the point that uh, what Aaron is selling us, yes, is a, is a, is a way of intellectual uh, point of view that um, puts a question mark on everything. And I think that is a very recommendable uh, point of view towards life. I mean, this is what we try to do in, in the academy. Uh, we try to tell people, um, look at the manipulations that images, texts, and every other thing that is conveyed to you, uh, they are what they mean to do to you and use your analytical tools and use your powers to to, to see through them or not just through them, to see what they are trying to do and to see how, how it reflects uh, on yourself. And I think that's a, that's a, that is again a, a very um, recommendable uh, message, which I totally um, you know, identify with. Um, one last question that I have for you sure. is um, the, the question of language. And, um, and in the introduction to the book, you, yeah. um, you have a very personal story about your grandfather who grew up uh, in Baghdad, in Iraq. Was it Baghdad? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's Baghdad. Baghdad. And um, it wasn't Mosul. I was, I, you know, I could have lied and put and moved him, <laughs> moved him a bit north, but no. He was I, I think Baghdad. the majority of Jews lived in Baghdad. So um, nearly the majority so, of Baghdad was Jewish at the time, but that's a different story. True. So, and, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting um, notion that you have there that um, they lived a very a, a very non-homogenic uh, uh, and, and plural community, you know, with Islam, with, with the Judaism and together with other uh, uh, fractions of uh, different religions and uh, more or less uh, coexisted together and, and in a very, uh, very good way. Uh, but this is the point which I wanted to ask you because they all spoke the same language. And you, you speak of the language as a, as a kind of... Uh, Again, trying to impose one language, like uh, a little bit like in the story of uh, the Tower of Babel, which you mentioned in the introduction, is a kind of uh, 
um, one language, one uh, one point of view, one. But the the example that you give there is the exact opposite. I mean, they all speak the same language, but they do allow for different points of view and different religions and different ways of life to coexist. So I'm wondering, what exactly is the connection of language to this question of uh, plurality versus uh, homogeneity? Yeah. So I mean, here I guess I, I might want to appeal to at least an idiom in English, I'm not sure if it exists in the same, in the same way in other languages, right? Which is when, when we say of, of people, someone, oh, we're speaking the same language, right? Which is not to say, oh, we're both speaking English or we're both speaking German or, or Arabic or whatever it is, right? But that we're thinking the same thing, right? That we're, we're um, and I think that in a sense, there, there's a spectrum here, but the Tower of Babel story, at least as I read it, when it says that they all speak with, with the same tongue, and, and this is also reverberates with uh, an inscription from Sargon II, where he says that he made everybody speak the same language. At least as I'm presenting it, it's not simply the fact that they are all using, they would all be using the same dictionary. Right, but that they were all thinking the same, and that was not the case in Iraq in the twenties. So to use that one example, right? If there were there are Jews, there are Christians, there are Muslims, Shia, Sunni, Marxists, atheists, uh, whatever, right? All conversing together in Arabic, right? So, but they're using language, which precisely is the thing that marks. Uh, human beings as political beings, according to Aristotle. So they're using language, but in order to negotiate their, their both their shared, their sameness and their difference, right? The, that they're not absolutely the same and they're not such that they're all just automata moving in the same direction, doing exactly the same thing, right? Which is, I think, the image of what the, you know, in this myth of Babel, what they had, what the dream was, it was that they were all united, right? That they all, they all moved in the same direction. They all did the same thing, right? And they didn't want to be split up, right? And at least that's how I read the story is like the idea is that that's, that's a false, it's, it's a very powerful impulse and, and desire and it and it recurs in human it's also successful i mean even incredibly. the story talks it's incredibly successful yeah and they they achieve what they what they i mean if it wasn't for god who dispersed yeah. them and made them speak different languages right yeah. they and, would have and, achieved what they their goal you know and here you know again i the book in a lot of ways was very influenced by hannah arendt and i think i would i would say that there's certain elements of certainly the extreme uh, political movements of the of the twentieth century, which are not by any means completely uh, that we have not completely abandoned by any uh, stretch of the imagination, right? Um, that th these are also expressing in different ways that type of desire to be totally united and moving as one, right? And I think that that desire, again, following Arendt, is precisely at odds with the the need to be political, which is the need to be political is to say, no, I'm going to repress that desire in order so that a kind of plurality that uses language in a different kind of way, not as, as a single thinking, speaking uh, way, right, is, uh, is at work. Okay. Matthew, I think we're open for questions if, you, if you'd like to introduce them. Um, Great. Thank you, everybody. I do have a few questions here, uh, some covering similar topics. So I'll try to condense them together. Uh, I have a few uh, people interested in the financial aspects of smashing idols versus not smashing them. Um, one of the question askers, question askers, I guess that's a word, um, brings up this idea that of the practicality of smashing them because ISIS knows or suspects that they can't move them on the international market. Hold that in your mind for a moment. Another uh, comment from uh, Captain Ali from the Iraqi Ministry of the Interior Anti-Organized Crime Unit. Uh, it, on the other hand, it is a personal witness to examples of ISIS storing artifacts for later sale into the antiquities market. Would you like to comment on either of those? 
Sure, I don't have that much uh, to say about them other than absolutely those are parts of the story that are important. Um, and in a sense, I mean, in one sense, right, it just can, it, it reaffirms part of the argument, right, which is that this is not really ever about eradicating images, which is not, which is not possible. And ISIS, at, as incredibly good at producing images, right, they're some of the best image producers that we've had in the last uh, decade, right? So if we were to, you know, um, they, they probably should have a space at the Whitney Biennial or whatever, whatever it is. Um, they're very, and, and so they know that, right? And I think that this is just continuing. So, so, rather, so it, it, what I'm talking about is the, how the iconoclasm is being used to produce, produce certain types of effects, produce certain types of, of political identity and othering other communities, right? So eradication of the gray zone, um, it's these image, these particular videos certainly were aimed primarily at a Western audience that they knew were going to get totally angry about the fact that um, these beloved objects were being destroyed. Um, and yet at the same time, of course, the, there are objects that were being um, moved on the, on the black market. Some, some people have gone so far as to be cynical as so cynically say that the purpose of this, of, of, producing an image of this destruction is to remind potential deal uh, collectors that these objects are being destroyed and therefore um, entice them to buy, you know, buy them and, and push the uh, prices up. Right. And, and I'm sure that, that these are, these are also Im uh, important parts of the story for sure. Great. Uh, next question uh, from Rachel Hallett. In light of your comments on museums and tapping artifacts, what's your view on the recreation? Uh, it's interesting. So I have a very non-realistic view on that, which I and so I'm going to I'm going to share my non-realistic view in the hope of some people who have much uh, better are, are much better situated to actually make things realistic might take it seriously, at least in some sense, and that is. I think we should be repatriating. We, I don't. I, I th instead of repatriating objects, say to Baghdad, um, and again, this is let's nuance, right? There are questions of like truly objects of theft versus ones that were acquired legally under the terms of the reality in the 19th century, which we might no longer agree with, but um, but under the under Ottoman Empire or whatever, right? There. So there's there's definitely there's range here. I don't want to be you know, but. To be a little bit provocative, I think that it's much more important to send um, Picassos and Turners to Baghdad than to send more um, Babylonian and Assyrian uh, objects to Baghdad. Um, by which I mean, um, I talked about my experience in, uh, in an encyclopedic museum, which I was very privileged to have. Neely mentioned that these encyclopedic museums are in Paris and London and Berlin and New York, right? For me, I would much prefer to, to see a world where that is no longer the case, by which I mean, not that everybody just looks at their own thing, but rather a 16 year old anywhere in the world should have access to being able to tap images and uh, think, think beyond and I mean, this is again, complicated, right? And at the same time, be proud of who they are, right? So both are important, but I think that it's so, but it's important to have, the, have this as a conversation. Okay, picking up on that, uh, Paul Flesher asks, um, how these images are used for othering, your point about that, and, and your previous point about creating understanding within the book, how can cultural heritage be used for reconciliation? And you're suggesting, that this idea of museums mm -hmm. um, showcasing other cultures around the world is an attempt to, to reconcile everyone with each other in this dealing with this pluralism. I suppose. Yeah, no, so it's a great, it's a good question. It's a lot is gonna deter, be dependent on what we mean by reconciliation. And, and I think that I wouldn't feel comfortable making a generalization on that because I think who are we reconciling and what do we mean by reconciliation in those cases? Um, if 
and, and how idealistic are we about being reconciled? I don't think that all human beings can be perfectly reconciled to each other. I think that's a, that, that dream is precisely the dream of the builders of Babel, which I, I wanna actually kind of um, say, we should, try, we should divest ourselves of that dream. We can certainly live better with each other than we do, right? Um, and so that finding that middle space is, I think, for me, so important. Okay, I've got one more here. Uh, if anyone else wants to throw something into the Q&A section, uh, we'll consider it. For now, Mark Smith wants to know even more about the biblical iconoclasm in more detail. Anything else you wanna say about that? Um, hi, Mark. Well, that's the first thing I'll say. Um, for those who don't know, Mark was my doctor father. And so it's a pleasure to note that he's out there even though I can't see him. Um, more about, this is particularly ironic because I remember the, many years ago, Mark invited me to give a paper on the golden calf. And so maybe what I can do is I can just read a couple of, par uh, a couple of paragraphs here um, in, in Mark's honor um, about the golden calf. While Moses was busy speaking with God on Mount Sinai, his brother Aaron made an image to guide the recently emancipated Israelites. Moses demands an explanation. I flung gold into the fire, Aaron tells him, and out came this calf. Aaron's denial of agency illustrates a common anxiety about authoritative images. We do not want to take responsibility for how they orient us in the world. Outsourcing that responsibility makes life easier. Men like Moses can't abide such chicanery. They know that images are the work of human hands. This doesn't make Moses any more open to political life than his duplicitous brother. His aversion to the golden calf cannot be appeased by correcting its false attribution. He seeks a truly transcendent authority. Each brother in his own way wants to escape human responsibility for political life. Neither makes room for politics as a human endeavor or the man-made images that necessarily come with it. In his opera, Moses and Aaron, 20th century composer Arnold Schoenberg reimagines the scene between the two brothers. Unlike his biblical namesake, Schoenberg's Aaron doesn't deny his own agency in making the calf, rather, he challenges his brother's idea that God's law can be established without images. Moses himself uses images, Aaron points out. When Moses destroys the calf with an utterance, the destruction serves as an image for the people. And the tablets of the law that Moses holds, Aaron asserts, these are no less an image. When Moses then smashes the tablets in despair, the violent act is just one more image. Recognizing his inability to escape images, Moses collapses on stage, wailing, O oh word, thou word that I lack. The opera continues with a final act in which a reinvigorated Moses condemns Aaron for betraying the idea to the image. But Schoenberg never composed music for the scenes following Moses' collapse. We, like Moses, the opera attests, can never escape images Iconoclasm itself engenders them. And so I'll leave it to Mark and the rest of you to decide which Aaron I um, most associate with. Uh, but hopefully that meets Mark's request at least somewhat. Great, thank you. It uh, looks like we have exhausted all of our questions. I wanna thank Aaron and Millie for coming out tonight to talk about the book. Uh, it looks like we had great participation and I think there's a lot of interest. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Neely. Thank you, thank you Matt. Great. Uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we have more content like this coming up in the next few months. So stay tuned. Uh, I posted some links to Aaron's book to purchase uh, on Amazon, but you can buy it, of course, wherever you want. Just buy it and read it and then buy another copy. Uh, 
Uh, I'll also ask you to check in on our YouTube channel. The link is in the chat and our Facebook page. The link is also in the chat. Like, subscribe, and you'll be on our list for upcoming events. Thanks, everyone, and have a good night or day wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you.